Hello everyone and welcome once again to Software Engineering. As always, I'm Bart Massey. As always, I sincerely hope you're doing, staying safe and doing well in these difficult times. Today I want to talk about something the book calls reliable programming. And it's one of these topics that had quite a bit of currency about 10 or 15 years ago as people looked at very large, very uh, questionable code bases and ask the question, are there specific things we can do in software development in the programming stage to actually increase the likelihood that our programs will work right, short of having well-engineered programs? I'm gonna, that's a caricature a little bit, but I'm just gonna go there. The point being that what this becomes and what I think this book chapter is, is a bit of a mishmash of topics that sort of lead into general reliability as a feature of software quality, but are maybe not super closely related. I'm So what do we mean by software quality? Well, reliability is definitely, and I should, so what I'm saying as I start here is that I'm gonna follow the textbook more closely even than I usually do this chapter. So if you see quotes or lists of things that are likely to be from the textbook, I just wanna make sure that the attribution's clear. So the book lists these quality attributes. It lists reliability, user experience, and maintainability as quality attributes. And that's fair, I guess. All of those things are definitely part of the quality of a piece of software, although, is user experience really part of software quality or is it something else? I don't know, but certainly reliability and maintainability are fair. We say a high quality piece of software is reliable and maintainable. Another, I'd add some more things just off the top of my head. A uh, high quality piece of software does what the user wants to do, which is what I mean by it's valid. It is transparent in the sense that looking at or reading the software lets me know what it's doing and gives me confidence that it works. It's small. We know that the uh, that a larger program, all else being equal, is a lower quality program. More code is worse in this situation. And there are probably other quality attributes we should be thinking about, but that's just a few. The one we're gonna focus on today is reliability. And the question is, how do we get reliability into software? But before we answer that question, I wanna contrast reliability a little bit with a couple other things that are often confused with it. Next week, we'll be I'll be talking with you about secure programming. And Reliability is a different thing from security. So what is reliability? Reliability is resistance against mistakes and the unexpected. So if the programmer makes a mistake or the user makes a mistake, a reliable program will take that in stride. If something unexpected happens in the software or to the software, reliable software will take that in stride. And that's a little bit of a contrast with security in Reliability, we're worried about things that happen by accident, mistakes. We're worried about unexpected things that happen by accident, you know, acts of nature. F security is resistance against active attempts to exploit mistakes and create unexpected situations for the software. So security is a thing where human beings, presumably, uh, some kind of adversary is trying really hard to make your software fail in interesting ways. That's harder for obvious reasons. We'll talk about secure programming next week, but it's absolutely the case that it's harder to defend against malice than against accidents. And so, yes, it's true that secure programs tend to be more reliable than insecure programs. Those two attributes are at least related. But notice that the easiest way to secure a program is to make it fail whenever anything seems wrong or suspicious. Uh, if you don't understand what the situation is as a programmer in a piece of software, a reliable program will try to deal with it. A secure program will refuse and 
probably crash altogether with the intention of not letting the adversary do a bad, potentially bad thing. So in that sense, security and reliability can be opposing goals. And so it gets complicated. The point is these are uh, sometimes go hand in hand, but they aren't the same. Another thing that we can contrast uh, with reliability is correctness. Reliability talks about predictable behavior of the software. I should be able to know what it's going to do. Correctness means the software, not only do I know what it's going to do, but it's going to do what it's supposed to, what I said it would do and what I want it to do. Correctness is clearly a much harder goal. I can have programs that fail in known and predictable ways that aren't too damaging to the user. Those are really kind of reliable programs. They just aren't right. And correct programs are reliable. If you get your program correct, then by definition, it's a reliable program, but correctness is hard, and a lot of times we settle for reliability. So there we are. So the book lists three techniques that they want to focus on this chapter for more reliable software. One is what's called fault avoidance, which certainly if you can avoid faults, your software will be more reliable. So the details of how that's described matter. They list input validation, that is making sure that the inputs to your program are what are expected, which is a kind of protection against user faults, I guess, but it's also a protection against program faults because programs don't expect generally to deal with inputs that are unexpected. I guess that's a tautology. Finally, the issues of failure management, we want the consequences of a failure to be something that is not severe as well. So we're going to try to reduce the likelihood of failure. Apparently, the book also counts as an aspect of reliability, low severity of failures, and that seems fair. So let's talk about fault avoidance for a minute. Uh, that, Like I say, that's a grand goal. We all want to avoid faults, bugs in our program, and, uh, you know, one of the easiest ways to do that is to have a simpler program. Simpler programs in general have less bugs. We know that there's a fairly constant factor, a very rule of thumb constant factor in terms of bugs per line of code. And so a smaller program is likely to be less buggy, but we also know that different kinds of code have different, and I say we know this, I'm mentioning research, I'm referring to research results. We also know that different kinds of code have different likelihoods of bugs. And in particular, code that's complex for, by various measures of complex is more likely to have a bug in a line of code than one that's simple. So how do we minimize this complexity? Well, first of all, it's very common in computer programming to try to be clever and do something that's fast or uses little memory or whatever. This is almost always the wrong thing. You should avoid these premature optimizations very, very seriously. What I mean by premature optimizations, I mean that optimiz the only point of optimizations is to meet a requirement, a not an extra functional requirement. So I might optimize to reduce the runtime so that it meets a requirement. I might optimize to reduce the memory usage so that it meets a requirement. Typically, the best way to do this is in two phases. We first give a design that we think has a reasonable chance of meeting the requirements. We implement it, we test it to see if it meets the requirements. If it meets the requirements, we are done. We don't do more optimization at that point because we've already met the requirements. That's what a requirement is. If it doesn't meet the requirements, then we're gonna have to repair that issue. The design apparently didn't meet the requirements. There's a couple ways I can do that. I can go back and redesign to use, say, a different algorithm or a different data structure. And that's usually the best way to meet the requirements. But that different algorithm or data structure may be more complicated. 
and but now I have to pay that complexity price because I have to meet the requirements. More commonly, the first simplest thing I specify is fine to meet requirements and I don't need to do something fancier and so I don't. And a simple algorithm is all else being equal, a simple data structure all else being equal is less likely to have defects in its implementation. And the other thing is that Dijkstra's gift to the world from ages ago, structured programming is really a thing. You really, all these things that we've talked about previously in terms of code quality, uh, eliminating copy paste code, using for loops that in most languages these days are, can iterate over a whole lot of things and reliably handle the end case so that you don't get off by ones and reliably handle the case where the loop isn't supposed to iterate so that you don't iterate once by mistake is a really good idea. When possible, if your language or its library or its standard libraries provide a data structure, using that is a really, really good idea over inventing your own data structures. You only invent your own data structure when the standard data structures won't do. And even when you're building your own data structures, you use the data types that are the best fit to what you're trying to do. So, for example, in Rust or, you know, C++, we have various integer types. I generally use 64-bit integer types for things by default because it's a nice large type that is likely to accommodate anything I really want to do with an integer type. And I typically use signed integers by default in the situa in C++ because I typically want to be able to deal with negative cases reasonably. Is that the best type of integer? Well, in general, I think it is. For specific problems, not so much, right? Uh, and so I may choose a better data type to fit my situation, some other kind of integer or even a floating point number. You want to name your values. So there's a style of programming where you write very large expressions. This is almost always a bad style. And one of the ways you can reduce complexity very cheaply is to break complex expressions up into sub-expressions and give each sub-expression sub a name by assigning it to a variable. And that's a really good practice. The book gives an example of this that sort of carries it to an extreme. And I think that in their example, both the big expression with the single letter variables and the thing with a million very long variable names combined in weird ways, both are hard to read. There's always some middle ground here. But in general, people do tend to be more about choosing poor names and then, you, then using them in very complicated ways to make complicated expressions. And so you really want to avoid that. Another aspect of fault avoidance is trying to reduce what's called structural complexity. And the book has this long list of things that's not a terrible checklist. It doesn't really support all of this that much, and I'm not going to either. I think you've heard most of this before, but these are things worth thinking about. Your functions should do exactly one thing. You should, you should think really carefully about whether your function might be broken into two functions. And you should be th thinking carefully about whether you need that function at all every time you have a, by function here we mean unit, procedure or function. Units should never have side effects. Uh, that isn't, function should never have side effects. That isn't really a rule and I'm kind of surprised to see it in this list. In a functional programming language, functions can't have side effects and that occasionally makes uh, things harder. I will say that this, I think this is what the book's actually trying to say. Functions should minimize side effects as much as possible, and side effects need to be well documented and well understood. And it's often easier to remove the side effect of a function by making it part of the re result or whatever than it is to deal with it properly and so functions should have minimal side effects and should never have side effects unless they sort of have to to make things better is absolutely a fair statement 
We know that deep nesting is bad. If you find yourself indenting a lot because you have complex ifs or complex loops or whatever, then probably that's made your program more complicated. There's more opportunity for errors. It'd be nice to untangle that. That may mean breaking stuff out into a unit or just redesigning the algorithm that you're trying to implement. Every class in an object-oriented program should have a single responsibility. Well, there's a bunch of rules of object-oriented programming, but that is one of the ones is that classes shouldn't be a garbage bag of methods. They should have, a class should really be an implementation of an abstract data type in modern programming. So I sh a class should have data that it manages and it should have methods that are essentially operations on that data. And that satisfies this class should have a single responsibility rule. And that's really how classes are mostly used in object-oriented programming these days. Minimize the depth of inheritance hierarchy. So there again, if your thing's an abstract data type, you're almost never going to have it inherit from anything or inherit have anything inherit from it. Exceptions might be abstract data types that have subtypes, and in those cases, the subtypes typically don't go very deep. We know that dynamic dispatch, which is at the heart of what object-oriented programming is, where you don't know what method you're calling when you call a method on an object, that's, you know, this, the virtual keyword in C++, that is, harder to understand and can be error prone and so you want to avoid inheritance as much as possible avoid multiple inheritance there again multiple inheritance is in these languages for a reason but use it only when you have to and be really really sure you know why you're using it it's almost never the right idea really that's a special case of a more general rule which is avoid object-oriented programming whenever possible we know it's not a great pattern a language like c plus plus does sort of encourage you very strongly to make your abstract data types be object-oriented but the object-oriented paradigm is prone to complexity it's prone to having a lot of complicated boilerplate code a lot of hard to understand control flow etc etc and so Simple imperative or functional programming, usually a better plan. Finally, and this is absolutely true, unless absolutely necessary, unless you you have performance targets, you know, performance requirements you have to meet, don't multi-thread your programs. Don't write parallel programs. Parallel code is 10 to 100 times more complicated per line of code to get everything right in and that's true even for modern languages that try to provide convenient clean parallelism so the only time you should have parallel code is when a performance requirement says you need to go faster and you can't figure out any other way to do it remember parallelism is a terrible way to make your code go faster because at most you'll get small linear speed ups I just got a 12 core Ryzen box and that's fantastic. So I'll get linear speed ups between 12 and 20, but probably closer to 12 if everything's perfect. Probably in real life, I get speed ups closer to eight. Eight's great, but a good algorithm can often give you speed ups of two, three orders of magnitude. Uh, you should always exhaust your other possibilities for performance before you try to think about parallelism as a performance tool in your programs. So that's control flow related stuff. Another thing that you want to think about is complexity of data. There again, the book gives this list. Uh, define interfaces for all abstractions, which is absolutely a good idea, right? You typically don't have a data type that sits by itself. Typically the operations on that data type are what makes the data type interesting. And so you should use your object-oriented programming or your interface types or whatever it is your language provides to make sure that interaction with that data structure goes through some sensible interface. And abstract data types are the biggest innovation of the last 40 years in programming. You really need to be using them. You really ought to have data structured as some kind of data thing together with a set of operations that can be performed on it. That's the only way to fly. 
The book recommends avoid using floating point numbers, and I understand, I guess, why they say that. Floating point numbers, even in the modern IEEE era, era are error prone. Uh, NANs and INFs and underflows and other things can make them fail in interesting ways in real life. Precision is a constant problem with floating point. Having said that, as somebody who has written a lot of digital signal processing code, you don't avoid the floating point numbers there, you embrace them because the integer code is actually much harder to get correct. So take any recommendations you read in a book with a grain of salt. This is one where you have to figure out what it is that they're trying to say. Never use data aliases. I never did figure out what they were getting at with that. So take that one for what it's worth. Input validation was another thing we mentioned as a reliable programming technique. And we know in particular in C and C++ that providing an input that's too big for the space that was allocated for that input has been a constant problem in this language family for 40 years, uh, 50 years. And so you really wanna be careful about understanding how much you're gonna take in and taking in no more than that amount the book suggests that a technique is to whitelist or blacklist inputs that you, you know, so check to make sure it's an input you wanted or check to make sure that was acceptable or ch blacklist is check to make sure that it's not an input that was unacceptable. Obviously the whitelist is easier to control. So for example, if you're accepting a choice of names, you know, you might, check to see that the name is some name that exists in your name database and whitelist to essentially your name database. For strings, regular expressions are a thing. In the book, this chapter, which is a weird grab bag of things, includes a whole bunch of discussion of regular expressions. Uh, regular expressions are awesome. I'm, I'm a big believer in regular expressions as a way to check and do other operations on strings. Uh, you should learn regular expressions, absolutely right. And that can be helpful as an input validation tool. And the obvious thing there again is checking your numeric ranges to make sure that the numbers people enter are legal numbers for what you're trying to do. When I was fourth grade in the 70s, I got one of my, my first commercial game, it ran on my CPM box. And it was an adventure game, and one of my mentors is like, well, what happens if you try to buy something with negative money? So I tried to buy something with negative money, and it turned out that that worked, and I got the object, and they paid me. And that was a revelation, right? You want to check if somebody's offering a price to you that the price is positive, and if not, you probably don't want to sell Failure management. So having having done what we can to make the program operate reliably under normal circumstances, there are going to be times when the program is going to fail. And the fail here can be a soft fail, like uh, the program state gets weird, or it can be a hard fail, like the program tries to write off the end of an array and core dumps. Um, you need to figure out We've talked about this before a little bit, what you wanna do in that situation. Do you want to stop the program from crashing? Almost certainly, that's a bad user experience most of the time. And but then what do you wanna do instead, right? So the question is, did the program crash because of a control fault, in which case, probably just going on, try to crash because of a control fault, in which case probably just going on is fine, or did it crash because there was data corruption? And you really, really, as we've, I think, talked about before, need to catch your data corruption as early as possible. This is why assertions are a good thing. This is why exceptions are a good thing. And it's often better to lose some work 
rather than keep potentially corrupted work. Uh, once work is corrupted, uncorrupting it can be very, very difficult. So we prefer that when we're lost, we admit we're lost and don't try to save things that are broken. Finally, the book talks a little bit about timing failures, which again, seems like a weird thing to put in reliable coding, but there certainly can be time requirements where if, a da if an answer is late, it's wrong. And in that situation, you're in what's called real hard real-time domains. Hard real-time is called hard both because the deadlines are hard and because real-time programming is hard. You really don't want to do this if you can. Uh, if you do have hard real-time requirements that are mission critical, then you need to have a different QA regime than you would have otherwise. You're gonna be doing a lot more inspection, maybe some formal methods and a whole bunch of testing to make sure that your requirements are always met timing-wise because that's very hard to do typically. So the other section in the book that I didn't talk about was the stuff about object-oriented programming and design patterns which those sections are actually reasonably valuable introductions to the idea of design patterns and object-oriented programming. That material doesn't really fit with reliable programming, in my opinion. It goes in the design chapter of the book, not in the reliable programming chapter of the book. And even in the design chapter, I find that those patterns really are useful most useful if you're doing hardcore object-oriented programming. There's still a lot of that out there, but for a more imperative style, which is becoming the new norm, the patterns apply less to some degree and are harder to interpret. And so I chose not to talk about that, but it's something you might get interested in if you do absolutely grab the classic books on that topic. And if you wanna learn about modern design patterns, for imperative programming and ADTs. There's books out there on that too. There's good books on anti-patterns and things you could avoid, which are fantastic in the context of thinking about reliable programming. So there's some stuff about reliable programming. I hope it was helpful. As always, thanks for listening. As always, uh, please do continue to stay safe and well in this difficult time. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks very much.